this is looking at the typical rations that we feed here at Galveston in my pack. So this is kind of a general ration that's fed to practically all Galveston in my pack. About half the ration, maybe a little bit more, is forage. And then we have about equal parts of uh, grain, processed grain, and then we have a protein supplement. So those are the three main ingredients. And over the last eight or ten years, we have done a number of studies to look at the influence of the type and the amount of protein that fed into a dairy cow has huge impacts on feed nitrogen insufficiency, so how much of that nitrogen or the crude protein being fed to the cow actually ends up in the milk and how much ends up in the manure. And then um, the concentration of protein in the milk and the concentration of urea in the milk. And it also affects various things on the back end of the animal. So it really affects the amount of nitrogen that is excreted in the feces, the amount of nitrogen that is excreted in the urine. It affects the amount of urea, nitrogen in the urine, and urea in the urine of the dairy cow is the most labile, reactive form of nitrogen on the dairy farm. It's not fertilized nitrogen, it's not biologically fixed nitrogen. It's the urea in the urine that is the most biologically active. And that can be related back to the protein, the type of the amount of protein that you dairy cow. And then, because that's very reactive, the amount of urea in the urine affects ammonia emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, it affects nitrogen mineralization in the soil when the manure is applied to the soil, and it also affects the amount of nitrogen taken up by plants. So that's why we analyze manure for ammonia nitrogen. So, what I'm going to talk about today is a study that we started uh, two years ago, and uh, we have some preliminary information on this. It is how much of the nitrogen in the major components of the dairy cow ration is actually goes into the milk, how much of that nitrogen ends up in the, in the manure, and after the manure is excreted by the dairy cow, how much of the nitrogen uh, is taken out by the crop and how much is uh, lost. So a general uh, diagram, and I'd uh, like you to focus here just on these uh, red bars. So here's how we did the study. First, we labeled four components. We labeled alfalfa silage, corn silage, corn grain, and soybean in the field with N15. And then we fed them as total mixed rations such that alfalfa silage was labeled in N15 and the other three components were not. Or corn silage was labeled in N15 and the other components were not. So on and so forth. So the mixed rations were fed to 12 dairy cows, three cows for <coughs> N15 enriched component, and then we collected the milk. So we can say that the N15 in the milk was associated with the alfalfa silage that was labeled in the ration. Same with feces and urine. And then we take the feces and urine that, again, are tagged for the particular component that was fed. And then we take it into various nitrogen transformation studies. So this is how we fed the TMRs. Total mixed rations, again, only one component has the way the tag in and the other three components do not. And then we collected all of the feces, all of the urine uh, independently, so we could look at nitrogen uh, being excreted in the urine and the feces. And then we stored uh, the manure individually in uh, barrels for land application for some of our nitrogen transformation studies. So here's what was fed. So alfalfa silage, about 32% of the dry matter intake was alfalfa silage. A uh, similar amount for corn silage, 20% for corn grain, and 13% was soybean meal. And uh, as we know, the silages have high uh, fiber content, whereas the corn grain and the soybean 
think they are uh, very soluble, very digestible. And the total nitrogen being very high in the soybean meal, and also the alfalfa silage, these are uh, the nitrogen biologically fixed to nitrogen. And then this is the added percent in 15 that was actually obtained from fertilizing these crops in the field before we process them. So here's how the animals responded to what was fed. And why we were interested in this is we wanted to see if the N15 bee was behaving like the N14 bee. So did our processing, conserving the feed, and feeding it to the animal behave any differently than its homolog that was not in the range. And basically, um, the cows responded similarly to all diets. So basically, a way to look at it was the cows were, the 12 cows were fed the same diet. Not, the only thing different in the diet is that one of them was in 15 vehicle. So, similar to my intake, the nitrogen intake, the milk production, everything. Nothing dissimilar. So the animals responded similarly to the diets. So here's how the nitrogen, nitrogen 15 is actually excreted by uh, the dairy cow. So we began feeding our N15 total extraction here. The N15 comes out first in the urine, then in the milk, and then gradually in the feces. <coughs> and then we started, we stopped feeding the N15 and started feeding the N14, and then the N15 concentration starts to decline in the milk and the feces and the urine. So here's how the nitrogen 15 was partitioned depending on uh, the diet. So here is the N15 coming out of the milk from the soybean alfalfa, uh, the soybean alfalfa uh, A, uh, or alfalfa corn salad and corn grain. And what we had to do was predict if all of the N15 was to come out of the animal, how many days would that take? Because what happens with the N15 or with any nitrogen source is that the microbes in the animal immobilize a certain amount, keep it in their gut, and then it, it, it's given off uh, little by little. So what happens is it takes about 40 days for the N15 to come out completely from the area now. And here is um, how it was partitioned. So soybean meal, 25% of the nitrogen associated with the soybean meal ended up in milk. And that was a high amount of probability of 0.17, pretty good probability for this type of uh, experiment. And that was significantly higher than the other components. The lowest amount of nitrogen coming out of the milk was that associated with the nitrogen in corn silage. So what happens with corn silage is most of the nitrogen in corn silage comes out in the feces, a low amount in the urine, and we're also getting uh, 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 the lowest amount of nitrogen in the feces comes from the soybean meal. So the soybean meal is being used very effectively to produce milk protein. Next comes alfalfa. Two, um, two crops to fix their own nitrogen, and the corn silage and the corn grain, there's uh, less being uh, contributing to milk. So then we took the manure from the different diets to track the nitrogen from the different components. So we mixed the manure and the feces in the field, and then we applied the field plus three bands or six bands per plot. And then we tilled it in, and then we kept track of that nitrogen for two years in, in the field. And here's what we applied to the field. So our goal was to get 300 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen application, and we came pretty close. So these are actual amounts that were applied. We had uh, an aspiration of applying 300. And what we really came up with was a little bit of variability. And this is the added percent in 15. 
The natural abundance is 0.366, so we did have something that we need to keep track of, uh, the field. Uh, the field. And here's what happened in the field. So this is N15 uh, in the manure that was taken up by corn silage, one year after application, and then the second year residual. So this is the N15 that came from the alfalfa silage of uh, manure. Uh, this is the N15 from the corn silage manure, corn grain, and soybean meal. So even in the field, with our fairly high nitrogen uh, soil inherent soil nitrogen rates for uh, mineralization here, the nitrogen contained in the manure that was derived from the soybean meal was significantly higher. 38 percent of that nitrogen was actually taken up by the corn silage crop, which is more than uh, than the nitrogen associated with the other diet components. So the next steps of this research is that we're going to analyze the N15 in the urea, in the urine, and also the N15 in the fecal fiber. Because what these are, these are proxies for how the animals actually utilize the nitrogen. The N15 in the urea, in the urine, is a proxy for inefficient use of that nitrogen by the dairy cow. And also the N15 in the fecal fiber, so that's undigested feed nitrogen, that's also a barometer for inefficient use of that nitrogen by the dairy cow. And then we're going to apply the N15 feces and urine in some of our lab experiments and greenhouse experiments, and then we're going to measure the N15 in the ammonia, ammonium, nitrate, and N2O, and then plant nitrogen uptake to get more precise information for how what we feed to dairy cows, how that nitrogen is used uh, in, in the whole dairy production system. So I take some questions. Got on. Mark, uh, can you look at or find correlation between the carbon nitrogen ratio and the feedstock? Availability and the direction that the nitrogen plant. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, do we do carbon and also on these stuff, so like the carbon and nitrogen ratio, and how that transformed into milk? Uh, yeah, we have done that, but I didn't uh, include the carbon biopsy. So, so following that, I have a question: see that ratio of soybean meal have a lot more nitrogen, or that would be a lower ratio. So, do you think that that might impact how that how that maybe the improvement is done? Well, um, I think what an animal nutritionist would tell you, soy meal does, does provide a lot of protein. It's very high in nitrogen, but also some of that nitrogen is being used as energy that we usually associate with only with carbon. So that pro that. Uh, High nitrogen source feed is providing protein, but also some some energy. So it's in our analysis of the CA ratio, and we have actually divided, as you know, the carbon into hemicellulose, cellulose, carbon. So we'll be able to actually look at the contribution for the different carbon fractions. I was just curious. So from a practical perspective, you know what what kind of changes would this point to in how we feed the dairy cattle? Well, um, say for instance, uh, more, more corn silage is going into cow diets to the detriment of alfalfa. Okay, so farmers are converting a lot of uh, perennial legume into corn silage because it feeds more dairy cows. So in terms of the whole nitrogen cycle of the dairy farm, bringing fertilizer in to grow an annual crop that feeds more cows, that's used inefficiently to produce milk, and most of it comes out in the manure. I think from a total nitrogen footprint, a life cycle analysis of nitrogen, I think that this is where it gets to be important. Yeah, how might you explain, uh, how might you explain the difference in the people nitrogen of this uh, of uh, uh, I think, but it's like, 
Right. Well, that's a good point. So we haven't really analyzed what the carbon. Uh, fractions in, in the manure, but what I had was a good course. I would help us out, as you probably know, there's a lot of protease activity during the inside of that nitrogen actually it is a little bit less available than the nitrogen, say, sort of email that's not conserved. But um, alcohol has a lot of stems, so it has a lot, of, it does have a lot of NDF. So, I think we just have to look at the chemistry of the feces to ascertain what's actually going on. I think it's more of a carbon, structural carbon, than just the nitrogen stirred. This part of the one that I'll start with the one that I'll start with. How do you prove the nitrogen is more than two? Well, uh, the question is, uh, you know, I think there's uh, more corn silage nitrogen or corn grain nitrogen that's actually stored in the body, right? Well, um, I wouldn't think so, you know, I'm a soils person, but I, I think what, um, you know, the, the animal isn't going to accumulate indefinitely, you know, it's, it's, it's going to, um, you know, it's not going to accumulate nitrogen or accumulate carbon, it's, you know, it's, Kind of an input at unless it's growing or unless it has a cap. So I don't think there's any accumulation going on. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think it's about 94%. Yeah. Yeah, so that's right. But I think that's more kind of a. Um, you know, we tried to force it to 100 and never got to 100% in the model being exercise, so I think it's more kind of uh, um, something with the model, not with, with the animal, per se. Yeah. 